folks. You ready to talk about the future? Come on, you guys ready to talk about the future? All right, let's talk about some fun stuff today. Get the uh, slides up here. So uh, we get our slides. There we go. All right. So Facebook's 10-year technological vision is based on three core pillars. The first is connecting the world. This is bringing internet access to the billions of people today who don't have it. The second is solving some of the hard problems in artificial intelligence to build systems that help us manage the immense complexity of online data and the offline world. And the third is building the world's best virtual reality systems that give you this true sense of presence, like you're actually at a place that doesn't exist with a set of other people who may be physically thousands of miles away from you and create shared memories and experiences like no other system you could have before. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about these. Let's start with connectivity. I think for the folks in this room, connectivity is something we take for granted. We connect over 4G and get annoyed when we drop down to 3G. But when you look at a lot of the world and how they connect on Facebook, even with 2G technology, you've got large swaths, these pink regions of the world, completely unconnected. And when you dig into why and try and understand why are so many, we estimate 2.5 billion people unconnected in the world, you realize outside of the very dense, wealthy urban areas, these terrestrial regions, it's extraordinarily expensive to provide the infrastructure needed for internet connectivity. You have to lay fiber cables through the ground. You have to build cell phone towers. You have to build all this infrastructure to allow us to have this amazing connectivity. And so what Facebook is doing with internet.org and the Connectivity Lab is exploring radical new business and economic solutions and radical new technological solutions to dramatically reduce the cost of providing internet access. In order to truly reduce the cost of this infrastructure, we think you need to go to the sky. And so we're exploring multiple different solutions for multiple different parts of the world. We announced earlier this year, along with Eudelstat and Spacecom, we're partnering with them in their Amos 6 satellite, which is launching in 2016, to provide internet access to large swaths of sub-Saharan Africa. And satellites are a great solution for these very large, very sparsely populated regions of the world. But you have to share the satellite bandwidth with everyone else in that region. For medium density parts of the world, we think what we want to do is provide aircraft. Meet Aquila, this is Latin for Eagle. This is our high altitude, long endurance, solar powered aircraft. It's designed to stay aloft from 60 to 90,000 feet in the air. For reference, your average airliner is typically at 30, 35,000 feet. It stays aloft, we hope, for at least three months at a time. It's powered completely by the sun, which through the solar cells powers it during the day. And then at night, it can power off of the uh, batteries, the lithium ion batteries on board. Here's a, an example of it in its hangar facility doing an electric test. These are the electric engines that power it. It's a little hard to get a sense of scale on these things. So I brought with me one of the engine pods. So this is the cowling that you use. Excuse me. I'm sure that may damage the speaker, not the engine pod. Even though this weighs about as a MacBook Pro, it's incredibly strong, as you can see, quite big. This plane, uh, despite its size, so if you were to park it in a hangar next to a, say, a 737, it's got a wingspan that's a little bit longer than that. It's about 142 feet. So it's, it's a massive aircraft in terms of size. But if you put a 737 on a scale, it weighs 150 to 200,000 pounds, depending on the variant. A kilo weighs 8 to 900 pounds. That's less than your normal car. So it's an incredibly lightweight, but large aircraft designed for long endurance flight. So that way we can keep it on station over a region for a very long period of time. But this aircraft is designed to provide internet access to regions that don't have it. So your next question is, how does it get access to the internet? And that's where laser and RF-based communications come in. The way this works is quite simple. You have a terrestrial region with existing internet access of some form. You uplink that access to a local aircraft, which is in range, and you can do this over RF or laser. I'm just going to move this engine pod out of the way so I don't knock it down while we're doing this. Um, once you connect to the first aircraft, that aircraft can then link to other aircraft who are flying nearby via laser-based communications. 
And the challenge with lasers is they have to be properly aimed at each other uh, to make sure that you get the actual signal occurring between them. And so in order to make the system work, we've basically built a tracking system that allows you to aim lasers between two moving aircraft that are quite a distance away. And the difficulty of this is about the same as me trying to take, a, say, a laser pointer like I have here and hitting a 10 cent euro coin, say, 11 miles away. And oh, by the way, that coin is moving while I'm trying to hit it. So it's an incredibly hard problem trying to track these lasers as you're moving. The other problem with laser-based communications is we're talking about doing this in the upper atmosphere. This isn't a nice fiber optic cable, which has a you know, very clean environment in it. This is the atmosphere. You've got water vapor, dust. You've got heat and temperature differentials. So you have challenges of making sure that that laser stays coherent, isn't interrupted in some form, as it's tracking between these vehicles. And so we've been working on systems that do a better job of reconstructing the beam on the other end. And we've done systems in the lab that give us tens of gigabits of internet performance across this open atmosphere or simulated open atmosphere, which we believe is about 10x better than any existing solutions. So you have an aircraft designed to loiter over long periods of time in a region and provide internet access, and a laser-based communication to provide a backbone throughout the internet. We have a full-scale version of this aircraft, fully constructed. We'll be undergoing flight tests, we hope, very, very soon. This is one of the many technologies we're exploring to help radically reduce the cost of providing internet access that we hope to work with and share with many of our partners to make sure those billions of people can get on online. That's the first pillar. The second thing I want to talk about is artificial intelligence. And the motivation for this problem is quite simple. It's something that all of you in this room know quite well. It's just the raft of online data. IDC says over the last decade or over the current decade, a 50x or so increase in data. Even looking at our own data set when we said, how much data does our newsfeed algorithm look at year over year to generate your newsfeed on Facebook? And we said that that increase was about 50% year over year. 50% more data every year. Show of hands, how many of you in the room get 50% more time awake every year? Anyone? I've consulted with lots of scientists. No one predicts that we're going to get more time awake in the coming decade, unless there's some amazing breakthrough. And so we have this raft of data that we need to deal with. And we need to build systems that help us manage that data. And we need to solve some of the core problems of making computer systems see the world as we do in order to make that happen. Earlier this year, we announced a breakthrough in basic language understanding and reasoning in AI systems. It's called a memory network. And what this does is it allows us to take the power of a neural network and give it a short-term memory. In this case, what we can do is we can feed it, for example, a synopsis of a movie. This is Lord of the Rings. If you haven't seen it, this is a spoiler. Please don't pay attention. Um, but once you feed it the synopsis of the Lord of the Rings, you can ask it relatively complicated questions like, where is the ring? It's in Mount Doom. And where is it before that? Well, Frodo had the ring, and Frodo was in the Shire, so the ring must be there in the Shire before Mount Doom. These are spatial and temporal related questions, relatively for a machine complicated reasoning that helps us build the basics of how these systems work. So that's language and reasoning. But so much of the world is visual. So much of the sharing on social networks is photos and videos. Much of your brain is dedicated to processing visual imagery. So one of the keys to building systems that work is teaching computers to understand the visual world. Next month, we're going to talk about uh, some breakthrough work we've done at NIPS, one of the premier machine learning conferences, on image segmentation, the ability to break apart. If I've got a picture of a US baseball player, and there's an umpire and a catcher behind them, and a pitcher on a pitching mound, where exactly does the bat end and the player begin, and the catcher and the coach and the pitcher begin? You can see one of these pictures here. It's quite complicated just by looking at the pixels to figure out which part of that image is what. And it's also important to understand that this is a baseball game and it's daytime, different attributes of those images. Once you start to understand attributes of these images, you can immediately imagine the applications to Facebook. With all of this data we could possibly consume for your newsfeed, all of the hundreds of millions of photos being uploaded every day, we want to do the very best job we can, making sure we show you exactly what we want in your feed. And by understanding just by looking at the pixels what's in this photo, we can do a better job of showing you what you want and not showing you what you don't want. But where the magic really starts to happen is when you take these systems together. So you take this reasoning system, and you take this image classification system, and you plug them together, 
and you start to build things that never existed before. This is something we call visual Q&A. And imagine that you're one of the hundreds of millions of people with some sort of visual disability, and you have trouble participating in the visual part of social networks like Facebook. And one of your friends who just had a baby posts a photo and captions it, my new assistant. There's technology already out there that can read all the text on the screen, so you would have it read to you that your friend posted, and it said, my new assistant. But you wanted to learn more about what this photo is. We've built a system that allows you to ask questions about a photo that it's never seen before. So it looks at the photo, and you can ask questions like, is there a baby? Yes. What's the man doing? He's typing. Is the baby sitting on his lap? Yes. Are they smiling? Yes. So a man with a baby sitting on his lap, typing, smiling, captioned my new assistant. You probably have an image in your head now of this, which is the photo in question. But if you start to put all of this together and take this language, reasoning, image understanding, and you plug in speech rec and speech synthesis, you can start to do all of this without ever having to touch the screen at all. Let's see what this looks like. This is a real demo. I'm sorry, we don't have audio. We try this again with audio. All right, you'll have to trust me. There's a person talking into this, saying, speaking the questions. Where is the baby standing? It responds, bathroom. What is the baby doing? Brushing teeth. So this is a photo the system's never seen before. You can just speak into the computer and ask it questions. So allowing you to see what's going on in the real world without ever having an interface with it before. But this is all about understanding the existing world as it is today. Another core challenge is understanding what's going to happen next and predicting the future. And we as humans are really good at this just by observing the world. Computers turn out to be pretty poor at it. So we started looking at different ways to have computers understand what's happening in the real world. One of them is by examining physical objects. And in this case, what we're doing is we're stacking blocks and having the computer look at them and decide by looking at them whether these blocks are going to stand or fall. You can see predictions here that's going to fall, 99% probability that's going to fall, 4% probability it's going to stand, et cetera. And so let's, let's look at this in real life. So show of hands, how many of you think this stack of blocks is going to fall? OK. How many think this stack of blocks is going to stand? It's about half and half, but a little bit more think it's going to fall than stand. Let's see. The computer gives us a 1% probability this will stand, and we'll run the tape. It's a little hard to see, but they move around and do not fall. So the computer here, just by looking at the image, so it doesn't actually have physical access to the blocks, is about 90% accurate. That's better than any human we've been able to get to, to do this, or most people around the office. So it's, it's a small thing. I, I'll tell you, I've gotten a little bit of uh, fun made of me around the office saying, so we're doing all this AI research to teach computers to play Jenga. Um, but you know, it is true. Um, it's a way to teach them how to predict what's happening in the world. So. You put all this stuff together and think about how this is actually going to occur in the real world. And you're seeing some of this in a product we've just launched called M. It's in small tests in the Bay Area. And this is an assistant where, via Facebook Messenger, you can ask questions. And you can ask any question you want in the world and do things in the real world, anything that's legal. And this is powered by humans and then backed up by AI. So it allows us to automate many of the things that happen here. And much of the technology I've talked about just in this section alone was actually already integrated into M and showing results to real people. So that's natural interfaces. The last thing I want to talk about is virtual reality. We've seen just an explosion in the richness of sharing in the world, from text to photos to videos, which we're now in the honeymoon period of, to soon immersive 360 3D videos, allowing me to explore the entire world, in this case of Star Wars, not just what's stuck in a single rectangle. Amazing immersive experiences. And in order to build the best VR experiences, we need to solve some of the core problems, some of the hardest problems involved in virtual reality, including driving the perceptual system to give me the sense that I'm actually at a place that I'm not there, allowing me to interact with that world, and building tools to allow people to construct virtual worlds or recreate virt real worlds as they might do. The Gear VR is our mobile product. It's the world's best mobile VR experience, shipping later this year for just $99. The Oculus Rift, shipping next year, is, we think, the world's best consumer VR experience. But where the magic really comes is where you add interaction to this. This is Oculus Touch, 
It's a pair of hand-based controllers. I see someone wearing an awesome glove right here in the audience showing it off. But it allows me to get my hands into VR and allows you to get to this amazing sense of presence. Let's see what this looks like. So on the right, this is the real world. On the left, this is the virtual world. You can see someone using the touch-based controllers and what they see in the virtual world. And you notice they've got a friend here in VR. And see how amazingly responsive it is. And you're able to do incredibly complex operations, in this case, bouncing a ping pong ball, fluid motions just with your hands. So you ask yourself, given the ability to have hands and head in VR, what can you do? You can do lots of amazing things. I've given this demo dozens of times and done it many, many times myself. And it's amazing how quickly, just with a blue disembodied head and two pairs of blue disembodied hands, your brain believes that that's another person there. And you have these amazing experiences with this person. You can fist bump. You can build things collaboratively. You can give a thumbs up. You can point. You can hand objects to each other. These amazing, amazing social experiences with the other person, even if they're not anywhere near you geographically. And that's the true power of touch and VR. But the challenge with this is, as I said, this is just a disembodied head and hands. Imagine what happens if you can start to bring the full power of expression of the face and all the parts of the body and the full power of the real world. And these are some of the problems the Oculus Research Group is undertaking to try to understand what are all the aspects of the world that we can bring into VR to build a truly immersive experience. So that's a short tour through the 10-year vision of what we're trying to get done at Facebook, trying to provide internet connectivity for the billions of those who aren't currently connected, solving some of the fundamental problems in AI to build systems that can help us navigate the world, and finally building the world's best VR system gives you a true sense of presence and social interaction in VR. Thanks for coming today.